So, you guys, I am so excited about what we have in store today. Last Sunday, we kicked off uh, part one of a three-week mini-series called Perspectives. And it's basically a TED-style talk, and TED stands for Technology, Engineering, or Entertainment, sorry, Entertainment and Design. And what TED does is it's basically a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organization that is um, celebrating learning through experts giving these short, punchy talks. And so we have uh, invited a few of you to come and share your perspective and what life looks like from your vantage point. So it's just been a lot of fun to get new voices and get to celebrate really what God is doing in all of our lives. So if you missed last week, I just have to give a shout out, go to the website, csvineyard.org, and watch Leslie Herman's talk about being an artist and the artwork of God. And then uh, Sarah Elmer, our worship pastor, uh, did a great talk on how she was changing physically and spiritually through this uh, exercise community called CrossFit. So those are on the website. Check them out if you missed them. They were amazing. So we are in for another awesome round of talks today. And first up is Ed Murray. Welcome, Ed Murray, to the stage. So Ed grew up in New Jersey, I believe, but he and his wife and two children have called Chester Springs home for the last several years. And you may know Ed as our bass player and as a life group leader, but his day job as a sommelier uh, takes him around the globe, uh, tasting, learning about, and selling wine. So take it away, Ed. Thank you. If I told you that in 1955, a trunk full of booze driven into a dry county in Texas from Oklahoma was worth $10,000, you would get a sense of the business that I'm in. No, no, I'm not a bootlegger. <laughs> I'm not a bootlegger. But, you know, one of the icons of our industry told that story at a conference I was at. This is a guy who, along with a bunch of other guys, were really forward-thinking in the wine and spirits business. They had an idea back in the 50s that the population would move south, there were affluent people in the north, and, you know, uh, folks would want brands in the south. And he told this story to open up his talk, and I said, oh my goodness, what business am I in? Because this was a new business for me. You know, as, as Allison said, I was a sommelier. You know, now I was in sales. Infinite gray areas in sales, aren't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, you toss in a highly controlled, highly taxed and regulated substance like beverage alcohol, and I can get into a lot of trouble, okay? So how was I going to navigate this new world? New world because I was a sommelier. You know, what's a sommelier? Well, it's a wine waiter. You know, that's the actual translation. It's a wine geek. I've been a little, I can geek out on wine. I can have some fun with that, yeah. You know, it can be a wine snob. I tried not to be one of those, though I've got a taste of that. You know, you like that. Isn't, that's snobby. But OK. All right. uh, you know, a person who knows too much about food and wine, or like I like to think about it, uh, the person who held the keys to the gastronomic nirvana of my guest. Because that magic of wine and food and conversation and dinner with folks that you love and that you care for is something special. And I was a part of helping folks create that. You know, there's an Old Testament prophet, a guy named Nehemiah, and he says in his book, you know, he, he says he was the cupbearer for the king. Well, I was the cupbearer for the king, too. King George Perrier. There he is. Yeah. You know, uh, George uh, is a Michelin chef, and I was fortunate enough to be, uh, to be sommelier in his dining room. It, it was just a fantastic time. I also spent time at the, uh, the Fountain Room in the Four Seasons Hotel under Chef Jean-Marie Lacroix. 
and that was just absolutely wonderful. I learned a lot about Burgundy there and met guests uh, that are still friends. Uh, you know, striped bass was really where I made my bones. I was the opening sommelier at striped bass. That year we were named uh, Esquire's Restaurant of the Year in the nation. Just, just a tremendous amount of fun. You know, the restaurant business prepared me to be an observant servant. You know, I want to believe that Jesus was working in me and preparing me for my future assignments when I was doing this kind of service. But, you know, what would happen now? How would I navigate this world of sales and sales leadership? And this was a central question for me because I had made a decision. You know, I'd gotten married, my lovely wife, Maria, right here, and we had had our son, Elijah, and I would see Elijah just in the morning around 6 a.m. for his little bath, and then I'd shepherd him on off, and I'd come back in at about 2 in the morning. The first time I was working for a wine and spirits distributor, and I walked in the door at 3 p.m., Elijah shrieked and screamed with delight, I think it was delight, and, uh, you know, uh, and I, was, I knew I had made the right decision. You know, a sommelier brings the best wine for the budget, the food, and the occasion. But it's, in sales, I'm the middleman. You know, I've got suppliers on this side. I've got clients on this side. And all of our interests don't always align. There's lots of gray areas. Okay, you know, the Wharton School in its business ethics class uh, notes th this question for MBA students. If a client overpays you and you know the client will never catch the error, do you share this information with your business partner? Not the client. Lots of gray areas. So what has helped me here? Well, God's presence and my identity in his son Jesus have been key factors to me navigating gray areas in my life. John records these words of Jesus in a book about his life and the times of Jesus uh, in uh, John 14, 26, 27. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or be afraid. You know, I accepted the call of Jesus at an early age, and his spirit has been with me ever since. And God has lavished his love on me in so many ways. He, you know, uh, this love that's free, that I, I couldn't earn. Uh, and it's created in me a freedom. You know, a freedom for a guy, a beverage director, who was out of work to go talk to Neil Stein, the number one restaurateur in Philadelphia at the time, when he was on the treadmill at the gym, and say, hey, I was at your restaurant Striped Bass last night. I had a fantastic time, but I think I can help you with your beverage program. I don't know where that came from. He said, yes, I got hired. You know, uh, the freedom to believe that I can do business in an honorable manner without the loss of business. The freedom to prioritize my family over my job. And the freedom to believe that the kingdom of God can break through at any time. You know, that's that peace that Jesus talks about, the kingdom of God. And especially it can happen when I'm at work. You know, let me give you a couple examples. You know, I've also had the freedom to be corrected. You know, right here, right here. You know, I was, uh, I was running up the stairs, I hurt my back, I immediately knew that, it, I knew two things in my heart, in my soul, that it was a sin issue, and if I got prayer for it on Sunday, I would be healed. I, I, I just felt that. Uh, it was a major injury. Uh, Elijah and Camille were kind of embarrassed, our, my son and daughter, because I was at a, one of their soccer games. Every time I took a step, I went, ugh! They were like, Dad, Dad, just stay in the car. Just stay in the car. Huh? Kids, love them. Uh, so I came up that Sunday. Uh, I got prayer. And Justin Barney, an old pastor who was here, put his hand on my back. And he looked at me and he said, Ed, I wouldn't say this to anyone else. But since it's you, I'll tell you, God wants you to get your priorities straight. Oh! But he was right. It was a word. 
He put his hand on my back, and I can tell you, I felt the power of God. Justin moved his hand off my back and said, my hand is really hot. That usually indicates there's been some healing. And I had felt like the nerve in my leg had been pressed out with an iron. In fact, I kind of saw that visual in my mind. I, went, I came up here not being able to touch my toes, and I walked back to my seat filled with conviction and able to do some hurdles. So uh, it was a, a lot of healing. But there's also the freedom to obey to obey what God is, is, is saying to you. You know, I travel quite a bit. I'm on the turnpike quite a bit. And I was traveling from Altoona to Cleveland, uh, seeing one, two grocery clients. You know, uh, Altoona is Sheets and Cleveland is Giant Eagle. And I stopped off. I'm somewhere in the middle of, the, of Pennsylvania. I call it Pennsylvania on that side of things. And then I'm in the hills. And I stopped at a rest area. And I'm sitting at the rest area. And I look over. And there's a woman in a van. And I, I really felt God said, you, you really need to pray for this woman. And I'm like, God, come on. I haven't seen a black person in 100 miles. I'm going to walk over to this woman. You know, her husband's probably inside. I'm going to put my hand on her. Well, I'm gonna, this does not seem like a successful strategy for me to get to my appointment at Giant Eagle, you know, that tomorrow. But I, I, I pushed myself out of the car. And, you know, this woman was escaping an abusive relationship. Uh, her sister was inside just taking a rest. She had a dog with her. She had all the clothes that she owned in the van that weren't a lot. Her possessions, her dog seemed to be her most favorite. And we just dialed down and we prayed. And, uh, you know, because God is so faithful, the kingdom of God fell and she, there, there was healing. There was peace for her. I was in our office, and uh, our supplier of ours passed away, a guy named Ed Lowry. Uh, we had about a year and a half relationship with him. He was a fantastic guy. He was a wrestler. You know, he had arms like this. And he went to bed, and he didn't wake up. Uh, and there was a real pall over the office. And uh, once again, I kind of felt that conviction to pray for people. And that's really tough for me. I mean, we're, we're in the office. And I really felt like God said to me, uh, you know, how can you be a life group leader if you can't pray with people that you spend a quarter of your life with? So I said a quick, short prayer. And there was, you know, th th there's a guy, uh, he's a, another director. He was emotional. He, he thanked me. He was like, that, that was very nice. And I, I, there was this peace, again, that Jesus talks about that came over the office. Uh, the other day, I mean literally just the other day, two weeks ago, I had the opportunity over my arugula salad and my glass of rosé to pray for someone at the bar. This is a person I've known for years. And she was talking to me about some things and we prayed right there in the bar. And she wasn't embarrassed. When you ask people who God highlights to you, do you want prayer, they, 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 they just about all the time they say yes. I, I've seen so few people who say no. So, you know, many of you are in business, and many of you have decisions to make, you know, every day about, you know, is this the right thing to do? And, you know, what I challenge you to do is to get that freedom in Jesus and do the right thing, because he is so faithful. He is with you. The advocate is with you. So I am Ed Murray. You know, I was a sommelier. Now I work as a uh, director of strategic accounts for a wine and spirits company. But you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus. And that's the thing that counts. Thank you. All right, good stuff, Ed. It's so fun to hear about Jesus being in the gray areas of our lives, right? In those things that don't maybe make sense practically or there's a tension that you have to live in. And then uh, for Ed to say, really, it was, it's Jesus and the freedom that Jesus offers him that helps him go forward with conviction and, and make the hard decisions, but also just to be present with people 
and to bring the power of prayer into the workplace. That was an amazing story. So, awesome. All right, so next up we have Elizabeth Baxter. And Elizabeth is an artist, but she's also a newly retired art teacher in middle school, of middle school students. And she helped with our first through fourth grade uh, kids classroom, Vineyard Kids in the back. And she became really well loved because she always incorporated art into the lessons. And I even heard one day that uh, she brought in clay for the students to do a pottery project back there. So she is a well-loved teacher from fourth, first through fourth grade. And now she and her husband, Rich, serve in Club 56 with our fifth and sixth graders. Yeah, it's a great time back there. Thanks for that shout out, Frank. Uh, and they also uh, lead an outreach team here at our church that goes to Phoenixville and serves food uh, for those in need in that community. So without further ado, welcome Thank Elizabeth you. Baxter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Janet, I just have to point out that it, there's weather right now. <laughs> it's an inside joke, sorry. They entered the room noisily, more like a herd of beasts than mannered sixth grade children. There's Robert, oh, he is always stirring up the pot. He's gonna be a lawyer someday. And he didn't need much, but the others constantly egged him on. These four boys went to the middle table where they always sat, but on his way, Josiah went out of his way to get a tall stool that spun promptly sat on it and began to spin, spin, spin. Well, I was waiting for the class to settle, waiting patiently, and I'm watching Josiah, and he shows no signs of stopping. And my fury rose. So, great idea. I'm going to walk over. I do. I bump him off the stool, take the stool, and replace it with a chair. But then, Josiah's fury rose. <laughs> oh boy, he picked up that chair and he threw it at me. Um, thankfully, he'd missed. I didn't really even think he was trying because I think he's a good basketball player. But anyway, it missed me. But he wasn't done yet. <sighs> he was furious. He went over to a table filled with clay projects. He flipped it. That, is, that was a first. And the clay shards just fell everywhere. The, the children were like my project. And then, as a finale, he walked out the door screaming obscenities at me. Coatesville is an often maligned, sometimes reviled community, especially in the media. There's extreme ethnic diversity that meets a very well above average poverty high taxes, and now public flight from um, the education, There's, the schools are shrinking. Lack of funding. I mean, we have dilapidated schools alongside these beautifully new constructed schools, and it just sends a confusing message. So I would often ask myself, where is God in all this? And after 29 years of teaching in the same school, North Brandywine Middle School, in the same place, Coatesville, I came to realize that if we let him in, and when we let him in, that God is really present and he enters our brokenness. But I had to learn that I had to listen, uh, I had to stay, excuse me, and I had to listen and see. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.16 of the message, so we're not giving up. How can we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. In the earliest years of my classroom, uh, I remember these eighth grade girls lined up 
watching me do a demonstration, and they were like, lined up like some movie from Mean Girls, about Mean Girls. They were like, hip to one side, eye rolling, teeth sucking, mm. And I knew I was not passing. Oof. The, the, just what they uncovered with their glance as I like feebly tried to instruct and show, and I could just like feel their darts looking at me. But the pain and judgment of inadequacy is easily uncovered, isn't it? Like, does it ever really change that inward rush towards insecurity or fear of not being enough when we sense somebody judging us? Does the mean girl ever grow up? Do you know someone or maybe are someone who gets sometimes still stuck in that middle school persona? Months or years later, there was a young substitute that turned up um, for the room next door. And before the kids came, as we were chatting, I found out that she also had faith in God, and she had quite a flair for putting together an outfit. <laughs> but neither of these things would rescue her that day. Ugh. I could hear it through the walls, yelling, more yelling, Ugh. that like frenzied feeling of commotion rather than like focus. Like there was activity, but this was crazy activity. And then when I met her at the end of the day, she was so angry, poised, with darts in her eyes. She's like, I hate these kids. I, I'll never be back. And I didn't really have an answer, because I knew that the defining difference between me and her was that I had stayed. I had stayed. I remembered feeling just like her, just like that substitute, feeling helpless and worried and, and frenzied myself in light of the hustle of the classroom, the hustle bustle of the classroom. But staying was teaching me. Staying had provided me, in this case, longer relationships with people who were sometimes difficult to love, yes, but sometimes also easy to love, too. And I just had that deepening with them that she didn't yet experience. And sometimes I still hated. But I came back, I think, in an effort to try and do it better, to practice. I had to stay, and I had to listen and see. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, things like they're often look like they're falling apart, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Do you know about the Sunday nights? Sunday afternoon, fading into Sunday evening, and the terror grips you. I have work tomorrow. I have work that I don't like tomorrow. I have work that I hate tomorrow. <laughs> ah, that the Sunday nights plagued me for years. I was often even on the cusp of feeling physically ill because I was just so faced with my own inadequacy and perceived helplessness. But each week, Monday morning came, and I came back to my middle school classroom that looks like this. Someone interrupts with random weirdness. <laughs> Pretty funny, actually. I enjoy it. Someone screams because there's a bug. OK, often. <laughs> there are bugs in the world, and we don't have screens in the windows, so. Someone is still living out drama from the bus. It's like, more often than I care to remember. Do you need a minute in the hallway? Just take your time. Someone cannot sit next to someone else. I cannot sit next to this person. No, no. It's like, please, please, just can, you, can I just at least tell what we're doing today, and then we'll talk it out? But then sometimes, someone can never settle and they disrupt and disrespect and fight and yell. And I have learned to answer back with the same, sometimes answer back with the same disruption, interruption, and even disrespect. I have. Teaching, among many things, is a crucible of refinement. It's that cauldron that finds us out 
and burns away the unwanted if we let it. But when brokenness presented itself, I eventually learned to not lash back, but to wonder, what is going on here? Or what does this kid need? Or how did this happen? Like, how did they get this way? And so there's the presenting behavior, right? And there's the, the emotions that express that behavior. But there is the history, the story behind the behavior, those situations that have created this underlying belief about themselves. So they might have an incarcerated parent, or people might be coming in and out of the household, or there's just sometimes limited, limited funds. And what do you do? There's so few choices, never having even maybe been out of the community. Then it's their perceived anger, their understandable anger. Excuse me, they, they might have been waiting long lines at the clinic or, or their parent is wrestling with addiction and they're not available to them. There is unmet expectations of the father coming back and restoring the family. And there's often frustration with just not getting it in the classroom and being frustrated and really hating school. But as I continued to wonder, when they present these big feelings, like how do I treat myself when I uh, have those same big feelings, sorts of big feelings? And I have to say that sometimes I treat myself, I've treated myself with anger and disappointment. And so I treated them that way too sometimes. But when I was able to listen and see and recognize, that God treated me with such tender, honest respect and listening, and perhaps I could do the same for them. I had to stay, and I had to listen and see. But staying was forming. Staying was strengthening. Staying was inching me out of my fear. I was learning to deal more effectively with something that was very difficult, the very definition of coping. And I found that I was doing this just bit by bit, as I could take the time to listen, as I could want God's voice in my life. And so it was in this listening, this dialing down and creating a stillness, a, a place in my life where I, would, where I would stop judging myself, stop criticizing, stop making excuses and justifying. I could really listen to the quiet contents of my heart. And sometimes it was pretty ugly. Oh, I hate, I hate Deontay. Or, oh, I really overdid it when I was like trying to correct Alexis. Or, oh. I am in such resentment about Dante because he is just intolerable. Or I, I have no idea what to do with Cassandra. She is like so deeply quiet and there is nothing that I can say that will reach her. Like the daily lineup of defeat. <laughs> but it was also more of a tangled mess. It wasn't so neat and tidy. My spinning mind, uh, different thoughts, motivations. What change could I even affect, really? But what I came to earn, an answer and learn was that the change was often in me. I was learning to live. I was learning to live in the growing reality of my own powerlessness. Mind you, it didn't give me uh, it didn't advocate my responsibility to act and to be a teacher, but I did understand that there is a God and I am not him, that I want control, but he really has control. Something that is kind of tricky, kind of slippery sometimes. I realized that my brokenness, that the brokenness in my students continue to reveal my brokenness. We were really not too different from each other, fellow wanderers together in need. 
And I was learning to live at first a few, then some, then more days in this very present grace. Things were a mess, really. But we were dancing on this knife edge of beautiful moments and painful moments and timid connection and broken connection and raucous laughter and angry tears. We were all swimming in the same sea of sorrow. But God was here with us in this crazy, unexplainable way. I remember walking into school some days, I was terrified and also wondrous, like how will God be revealed today? What's gonna happen? And I suppose that is because God is both terrifying and wonderful. You might think that I knocked Josiah off that stool when I was a young, immature teacher, but please, this just happened in my last year of teaching, <laughs> three months ago. I am still fallible, making horrendous mistakes, my need ever present. What could I have done differently? How could I listen and see in this instance with Josiah? Well, he was wild-eyed and reckless. I mean, he would leave the halls, he would leave the classes without permission to wander the halls. His interest was more in terrorizing than learning. He was really not interested in school. Sad. And you might, have, you might surmise that his personal life was just chaotic. All manner of resources, a need. And so, what might I have done differently? Um, gee, I could have gone up to him individually, knowing his need for attention, and just spoken with him individually. But I also might have recognized that my history with him was quite checkered in my abilities to manage him. So I probably should have just left him alone, just ignored his behavior. Listen for God to let me see. I had to stay, and I had to listen and see. I recognize that not all of you are middle school art teachers, but you are people that know what it's like to stay in difficult circumstances, to feel the sting of brokenness in relationships or hopes, even defeat, and wonder where God is. And the good news the best news is that he is right there with you. You don't have to hide or cloak your weakness. He welcomes you. He knows you. And it's in this freedom of acknowledging your real self coming clean that you can relax and be your real self before God because he loves you, and he knows you, and he accepts you. He sees you, and he is really willing to enter that brokenness with you, come alongside you, and he will make a way so you're not giving up. How could you? Even though on the outside, things look like they're falling apart, in and around you, on the inside, God is making your life new. And not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Thank you.